So let's go ahead and take a look at all of the rest of the anatomy within the digestive system that's not involved directly with the alimentary canal. So the first thing we're going to look at is the anatomy of the oral opening. In the anatomy of the oral opening, we're going to have things such as the hard and soft palate, the teeth, connecting the teeth to and surrounding the abolus within the maxilla and the mandible will be the gingiva, or what people refer to as the quote-unquote gums. We will have the labia fernellum, both the inferior and superior. This is going to connect the lips to the maxilla and the mandible in both the uh, anterior and uh, areas of the mouth. We will have things like the tonsils, in which we'll see the palatine tonsils. We will see the uvula, which is the posterior edge of the soft palate. Surrounding the uvula will be a whole bunch of pressure receptors that are involved with the uh, initiation of swallowing and or a gag reflex. We will have the tongue with the associated uh, gustatory centers, taste buds. And remember, like we talked about with the special senses, there's no true map of distinct taste regions on the tongue, unlike what has been uh, previously discussed. In terms of teeth, we have distinct types of teeth, such as incisors, canine or cuspid, premolars or bicuspids, and then molars. The dentition pattern that we have is what's referred to as an omnivoric dentition pattern, which means we have what's referred to as a 2 1 2 3 per side, per mandible, or per maxilla. The dentists will number these teeth different than how most other uh, professions will number them. And so if you're thinking about going into dental hygiene or into dentistry, you'll have to learn different sets of numbers and organizations to the teeth. This 2 one, two, three pattern it means that there are two incisors, one canine or cuspid tooth, two premolars or bicuspid teeth, and then three molars. Along with this dentition pattern, we will have various eruption patterns of teeth where you will have two full sets of teeth for everything but the molars where you only have one set of molars. We'll talk about what each tooth does here in a second. Along with these structures, we're going to have associated structures such as the salivary glands, which include the parotid gland with its associated parotid duct, the submandibular gland, sublingual gland, as well as muscles that are going to be involved with mastication, such as the masseter, the temporalis, the turgold muscles, muscles that are going to be involved with motion of the tongue, such as the myohyoid and the tongue itself. The muscles that we're looking at here are going to be involved not only with mastication, but also with the secretion of glandular secretions from the salivary glands. We have three distinct salivary glands that are going to come into play. The three distinct salivary glands have slightly different glandular structures to them, in which we have the submandibular, sublingual, and parotid. The sublingual does not have a true ductal network to it, unlike the submandibular or parotid, where the parotid actually has a full elongated duct. The sublingual, on the other hand, will be releasing secretions into what is referred to as the sublingual duct. However, the sublingual duct doesn't have an actual excretory duct associated with it. It will simply allow for leaching of materials from the colloids surrounding the acenar cells within the sublingual gland to move into the oral opening itself. The submandibular and parotid glands have acenar clusters that do not form colloid clusters. However, the secretions themselves will go directly into the ducts, and then from the ducts, they'll go ahead and move into the uh, oral opening. In the study packet, I've given a little bit more detail into the types of chemicals that we'll see with saliva and the overall function of saliva. But saliva is going to, in terms of overall function in the oral opening, is going to provide a protective function to the teeth, as well as initiation of immune functions within the oral opening. Along with the salivary gland, we will have the tooth 
all teeth have this generalized structure to it where we will have the tooth itself broken up into two parts. The part deep to the gingiva is referred to as the root. The root will be sitting inside of the avalus of either the mandible or the maxilla. Held in place, what's referred to as the periodontal ligaments. Coming away from the periodontal ligaments, there will be what's referred to as the cementum. The cementum will run in continuation with the crown and the enamel of the tooth. The enamel of the tooth is the hard bony structure that we associate with teeth. It usually will have what's referred to as the cusp of the tooth, and we'll take a look at what the cusps are here in a second. Deep to the enamel is a secondary type of bone tissue known as dentin. Inside the dentin, we will see what's referred to as the pulp center. The pulp center is the central region within the tooth itself that will house the blood vessels and the nerves passing through the root canal. Damage to the enamel is usually what will result in a cavity to the tooth. If the enamel is fractured and the fracture reaches down into the cementum, it may result in loss of the tooth due to necrosis. If enamel is damaged into the dentin, the tooth may be lost. And the loss of the tooth will result through processes of root canal. And in the root canal, what's going to happen is that the dentist will go about removing the uh, infected part of the tooth, starting from the enamel down into the uh, pulp of the dentin. The enamel is hard bone structure. It's not calcium hydroxyapatite. It is a fluoride hydroxyapatite crystal. This fluoride hydroxyapatite is why you need to make sure there is fluoride in small quantities within your diet. For those of you that get and consume tap water, you have enough fluoride coming from the tap water. You can go about supplementing fluoride through various fluoride rinses and washes. However, you do not want to over fluorinate the tooth because it can actually lead to weakening of the enamel due to fluoride regulatory processes. So let's go ahead and take a look at each tooth and discuss a little bit about its individual functions. So each tooth is going to have its own anatomical shape. This anatomical shape is going to dictate the function of the tooth itself. Incisors have a beveled crown. The beveled crown acts as a shear. And what it will do is that upon overlap of the maxillar and mandibular incisors, we will get a cutting action within the food materials shearing them into smaller bite-sized pieces. The canine or the cusp have a single point crown to them. The single point crown is meant to puncture food materials so as to hold it in place so that the incisors can go about shearing it into smaller bite-sized pieces. The amount of crown within the cuspid is genetically and hormonally influenced. The next set of teeth is the premolar or the bicuspid. Notice how we have two distinct cusps relative to the canine with the single cusp. The premolars are going to grind and pulverize soft pulpy material into long strands. The incisor, the cuspid, and the bicuspid will usually undergo a secondary tooth eruption where we will have the immature followed by the permanent tooth. The other teeth are the molars. The molar, we get one set throughout the life. They are the last of the teeth to initially erupt and the final tooth to erupt. The last of the molars usually erupts somewhere in the late teens. And based off of old nomenclature in terms of liability issues, the last of these molars are referenced as the wisdom tooth, an indication that the person has become wise by the time they reach 18 or 19 years of age, which can be kind of an oxymoronic and non sequitur if you think about 
how wise people might be in their late teenage years. The molars themselves are going to be pulverizing hard pulpy things into smaller bits of material. So the premolars will be involved with shredding and shearing of things like meats, whereas the molars will be involved with shearing and shredding of things like vegetables and nuts. So let's work down and look at the liver and the gallbladder, and we have to think of them as connecting and working as a single unit. Now, most books will talk about the gallbladder simply as an organ that holds materials. It's not just holding materials. It will also be producing materials. Both the liver and the gallbladder will be producing bile. A majority of the bile will be coming from the liver through its excretory function. Bile will be moved from the liver into the hepatic bile ducts and then down into the common bile duct for re release into the duodenal papilla via relaxation of the sphincter of Odi. Hepatic function is based off of blood flow coming through the hepatic portal system, which includes blood flow from the right and left gastric veins, the pancreatic and splanchnic vein, the superior and inferior mesenteric veins, and all of their venal branches coming away from the intestines. What the hepatic portal system is doing is it's shuttling blood into the liver for absorption and first pass screening of anything that happens to be coming in from the digestive system. This first pass system is part of the overall function that the liver has in terms of excretory function, but also in terms of gastrointestinal function as it will set up post prandial after meal neuroendocrine responses. If we look at the liver in terms of anatomy, we have two primary lobes. We have a right lobe and a left lobe. The right lobe is going to be predominantly involved with excretory function, whereas the left lobe is going to be predominantly involved with digestive function. The right and left lobe is separated by what's referred to as the falciform ligament. The falciform ligament will form into a round conical structure known as the round ligament that will allow for an artery and vein to pass along as well as hold the liver in place with the omentums that we previously looked at. On the superior margin, we have the coronary ligament, which will hold the liver in place along with the, around the diaphragm. On the lateral margin, we will have what's referred to as the costal lines. That is the uh, invagination of the costal bones onto the lateral right margin of the liver itself. If we look at the inferior posterior view of it, we have to remember that we, we basically have flipped the individual over. So the posterior side here is to the upper edge of the image, whereas the anterior side is to the lower edge of the image. In this view, we have two other regions of the liver that can be indicated, which includes number six, the caudate, and number three, the quadrate lobes of the liver. We will also see the vena cava passing along the inferior aspect of the inferior and posterior aspect of the liver itself. As we dive into the liver, we will get distinct types of cells. Each cell is going to indicate a different function, which we'll talk about when we get to the physiology of the liver. But these include hepatocytes, which are the principal, site, principal cell within the liver, as well as kupfer and stellate cells found within the sinusoid. The cluster of the sinusoids are going to junction at the bile duct and stem from the portal vein. And they will flow towards the central vein, form what's referred to as the lobule, which is the functional unit of the liver. So if we look at the lobule itself, this is what we're looking at, is that it's bordered by what's referred to as the hepatic triad, which is a cluster of a branch of the portal vein with the branch of a hepatic arterial and a branch of the hepatic bile duct. In this, there is an opposing flow of blood, a counter current, in between the 
arterial and venal flow coming away from the triad through the sinusoid towards the central vein, where bile will be heading in the opposite direction, where hepatocytes will be interacting with fluid flowing through the sinusoid and being filtered at the sinusoidal epithelium. Inside the sinusoid itself, we will have the Cooper cells. In between the filter membrane of the sinusoid, the sinusoidal epithelium, and the parenchymal or the hepatocells themselves, we have the stellate cells, which are going to function as immune cells. The hepatocytes and the Cooper cells are going to be responsible for the quote-unquote detoxification of materials passing through the lobule, processing things for removal in the form of bile, sweat, or urine. Along with the liver, we will also have the gallbladder producing bile. The bile that's being produced primarily from the gallbladder is going to be a uh, alkalinic solution with not as much in terms of digestive uh, enzymes as what we see coming from the liver itself. The gallbladder will also be involved with storage of bile when not being actively pumped into the duodenum. The pumping action coming from the gallbladder is regulated by the muscular layer surrounding the uh, mucous membranes and around the cystic duct. Now, the cystic duct is kind of interesting because the cystic duct has what's referred to as myoepithelium within it. And what this myoepithelium is going to be able to do is going to be able to pump bile in both directions, both towards the gallbladder as well as towards the common bile duct. During active pumping, it's going to pump in a downward fashion towards the common bile duct and then allowing for ejection through this relaxed sphincter of Odi. However, when bile is being produced but not actively released into the duodenum, the same spiral muscles will siphon bile back towards the neck and into the body of the gallbladder. The problem with this is, is that the salts within bile can very easily come out of solution. And if the bile is allowed to sit within the gallbladder for extended periods of time, can lead to the gallstones that may afflict people who have excessively fatty and or spicy diets. The last of the organs that we're going to take a look at here is the pancreas. We're not going to look so much at the endocrine side, the alpha and the beta cells. We're going to look at the delta F cells and the acenar cells that are responsible for production of digestive secretions. The principal cells that we're going to be looking at here are the F cells and the acenar cells, which can be involved with the production of enzymes for digestion, as well as bicarbonate to neutralize the acids coming out of the stomach. But we also have regulations coming from the beta cells within the islets, as well as other hormones being produced by the pancreas. If we look at the pancreas itself, we have what's referred to as the body of the pancreas. The body of the pancreas is going to be anchored onto the duodenum in the duodenal curvature, whereas the tail of the pancreas is going to be angled out towards the spleen and held in place by the uh, mesentum and the greater omentum. Central to the body and tail of the pancreas, we will get the pancreatic duct. The pancreatic duct will head out towards the acenar cells to collect acenar secretions. Each part of the pancreas is divided into various septal lobules by the septums. Within the septums, we will see the islets of Langerhans with their capillary networks surrounding them and embedded within them. The pancreatic duct actually has a bifurcation as it starts to interact with the common bile duct. There are two distinct ducts that will come out from the pancreas. One is going to junction with the common bile duct and enter into the uh, duodenal uh, papilla at the sphincter of Odi. There's a secondary duct that's going to head up towards the ampulla of Vatter, which is going to attempt to neutralize with bicarbonate secretions coming from the pancreas prior to exposure to the bile bicarbonate in an attempt to prevent excessive etching of 
the lumen of the duodenum from the acids coming out of the stomach trapped within the chyme. 